Welcome to the Rhino Podcast, brought to you by Rhino Records. Interviews with your favorite artists and bands about the songs and albums you love. Here's your host, Rich Mahan. On this episode of the Rhino Podcast, our guest is none other than Tom Johnston, singer, songwriter, and guitarist of the Doobie Brothers. Welcome back to the Rhino Podcast, friends. As usual, we have John Hughes with us today. John, how are you? I'm good, Rich. How are you doing? I'm doing just fine. Thanks very much. Enjoying the last of this beautiful fall weather before it gets cold. Right. It's already chilly here in Southern California, of all places. I know. I'm out here in Nashville, and it's been gorgeous. We've had 80-degree days this week, but there's a cold front coming in, and there's snow to the north. No, 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 no. I know. So what's going on on Rhino.com? I know it's this time of year we always get flooded with a ton of great releases, and this year is no exception. You know, we were still celebrating the 50th anniversary of Led Zeppelin III. I mean, just a classic oh, yeah. album. And one of the ways we're celebrating is we have a Led Zeppelin III bundle on Rhino.com that includes the uh, super deluxe edition of that album that comes with an additional CD and LP of previously unreleased studio outtakes. And it also includes that new seven inch single, which is the uh, Japanese replica single of immigrant song and Hey, Hey, what can I do? And that's going to come out January 15th, 2021, but it's limited to 19,700 units and you can get it with that awesome Led Zeppelin three super deluxe box in a, Money saving bundle on rhino.com. Yeah, that's great because that Led Zeppelin 3 Super Deluxe box was out of print for a while too. So if you missed out on that one, this is a great chance. And then, of course, the collectible seven inch with the Japanese artwork too. It's a very cool piece. And you're kind of covered on all formats with that because it also comes with an HD download card that has the original album and all that companion audio in 96 24 bit uh, resolution. So it's a really good package. Nice. Something that just, you know, comes right to the heart of my 80s loving soul, and that is the Depeche Mode <laughs> Songs of Faith and Devotion 12-inch singles. I know it's technically 90s, but, you know, I, I still put them in the 80s, I guess, because I grew up with them. It's a deluxe sure. box set. It has eight... 12 inch vinyl discs with all the singles I Feel You, Walking in My Shoes, Condemnation, which is a personal favorite of mine, and In Your Room, plus all the B sides, all the mixes, the live recordings, all around that time of songs of faith and devotion. And that is coming out in just a week. I always love uh, 12 inch singles because you get those extended mixes and you sometimes get extra verses or, you know, just the extended parts of the grooves that you love. Very cool way to listen to those songs. And if you're, you know, at home, stuck at home, and you're practicing uh, your DJ skills, here you go. You've got some vinyl. <laughs> Do it on vinyl. Don't try to DJ digitally. Come on, people. Keep it real. That's right. That's right. That's right. Uh, another thing that I'm really excited to tell everyone about is that Aretha Franklin Aretha box set. It covers nearly 60 years of her career. It's four CDs. It's got 81 tracks. 19 of those are previously unreleased alternate versions, yeah. demos, rarities, live performances. But if it's a little much for you, but you want some Aretha in your life, there's a two LP version and a single CD version, which has highlights from that box set. And that's coming out November 20th. I love listening to alternate versions of Aretha's stuff because truly each take with her was a performance and you always hear different inflections and phrasing and she's just wonderful to listen to. If you want to tease, there is a single of her doing uh, the classic Broadway tune Somewhere from West Side Story that's on digital services now. If you want a little taster, go check that out. There you go. Well, that sounds great, John. Thanks very much. Hey, I will talk to you next time, Rich. Stay safe out there. You too. See you soon. Well, Tom Johnston is a founding member of the Doobie Brothers, 
And he's our guest today on the Rhino Podcast. The singer, songwriter, guitarist, and his band are celebrating their 50th anniversary this year and are being inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, an honor that many in the rock world would agree is long overdue. To celebrate this momentous year of Doobie Brothers achievements, Rhino has released the Doobie Brothers Quadio four-album collection on Blu-ray discs that features the original quad mixes of Toulouse Street, The Captain and Me, What Once Were Vices Are Now Habits, and Stampede. Besides the quad mixes of these albums, which play the best effect on a surround sound system, there are also high-definition stereo mixes, which will play on your Blu-ray player as well. You really have to hear how pristine and clear the music sounds delivered this way, and I myself was surprised just how great these mixes do sound. Tom spoke with us about the formation of the band, much of their 70s output, and the upcoming 50th anniversary tour, which has been rescheduled till 2021. Tom, thank you so much for joining us on the Rhino Podcast. My pleasure. Right on. Let's just start at the beginning with the formation of the band. Why San Jose and not San Francisco? Especially during that time period, San Francisco was such a massive music hub. Well, it's not that we didn't all hang around in San Francisco at that time. We did off and on. But uh, we lived in San Jose. I was going to school. That's the reason I came to San Jose. Okay. Uh, Pat was also in school. I didn't know him at the time, but... um, that's the two that were in school. That's the reason they were in San Jose, they being me and he. Right, yeah. John Hartman came out along with a guy named Greg Murphy from Washington, D.C. area in search of getting in touch with Skip Spence or anybody else from Love Great. And because I already, I was already hanging around with Skip Spence at that time. Yeah, I was going to ask about the Moby Grape connection. I don't think a lot of people know that. I, it's kind of 50-50. Some people do and some people don't. Yeah. It was a band that we all admired coming up. I was listening to when I was in junior college in Visalia. So especially the one album, the one they took down on 4th Street in San Rafael where they're all in front of it. And that was a great album. I mean, it just yeah. was. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, and everybody in the band felt that way before we ever met each other. So that became, I guess, part of an identity thing for us. So John came out. I introduced him to Skip. Skip was never part of the band. It's just, we all love that band. And sure. we, so we started making our own music. I already had a band with John before I even met with Pat. And we were doing a gig with Skip the night we met Pat over in Campbell, California. In a, in a little place called the Gaslight, I believe it is. Gaslight, yeah, Gaslight. And he was playing with a guy on banjo. And he was playing acoustic and singing. And we were doing kind of a rock and roll thing with Skip. And that's the first time I'd ever seen that. And we, we were knocked out. I'd never heard anybody fingerpick like that. In fact, I don't know if I'd ever heard anybody fingerpick at that point. So it was really a trip. And we invited him to come over and jam. After the first couple of times of jamming, I think we decided, you know, this could be, a, this could be cool. This could be a band. So we took off in that direction. And the writing just sort of started happening. Nobody yeah. ever talked about it. But I said, I got a song. I got a song. And we try to complement each other's songs with whatever we could provide. You know, like if Pat was doing a finger picking style or even, you know, strumming style, didn't matter. And he would do the same while I was doing it because it was only four people at that time. Right. And, and we was Poe and we was living in San Jose at $40 a month rooms and stuff, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Happy as a clam. Yeah, I'm sure. Of it. Didn't yeah. know anybody any money and didn't care. Yeah, right. No bills. Nope. It's just uh, having a good time. You know, I still go to school, but I wasn't the most industrious student that ever lived. And <laughs> I was an art major, so it afforded me to be that way. That's kind of nice. Yeah. Well, it was a creative mindset, at least. So similar. Yeah, very much so. Yeah. 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 And then I'd come home and, and music was always going on in 12th Street House. So it, was, it just all worked in, in favor of the musical direction. After a while, playing around, gigging around quite a bit, you guys made a demo, and Ted Templeman at Warner Brothers found out about you. How did that happen? How did it get in his hands? We went up and did the demo in San Mateo, which was up then, down now. I believe Skip had something to do with getting us in that studio, which was called Pacific Recording, and that's where Santana did his first album. So we went in, and we just started noodling around, and, and we cut, what, five, six songs, I guess it was? I still have the original demo tape. It's amazing. No kidding. 
it's even better if you play it backwards. But uh, <laughs> I digress. Anyway, that's what went to LA, those songs. The only thing that was on that tape that actually ended up on the first album was Nobody. <laughs> And they, on the strength of that tape, decided we're going to sign you. And Lenny, who actually produced the album, and Ted Templeman flew up to watch the band in the studio where we actually played for them live. And that was the beginning of the whole thing. And then Ted produced all the albums after that, didn't he? Up through One Step Closer, right? Yes. Yeah. All four of these albums, uh, after the first album, are on the Quadio box. What was it like working with Ted on those albums? What kind of a producer is he? What's his style? Ted, he was never pushy, but he came up with a lot of ideas, and he kind of got you excited about it. Yeah. So you were just starting out because we didn't know. We didn't have any experience. Our first album we did, Lenny was a great producer. You know, it's a Manny Newman. He's done Rick Lee Jones. He's done Paul Simon, whatever. But they didn't work the same. They were two different personalities. We had started on the second album on our own with a guy that sort of managed us, who was also an engineer. He also engineered the first album and the first demo, but we weren't getting anywhere. We, we wrote songs and we wasted money on Warriors time. And uh, they said, you know what? Cause we started sending them stuff. Said, We're not happy with this. This isn't going where we needed to go. So that's when Ted came up and took over. And that was at Wally Hyders in San Francisco. Okay. And somewhere in that point in time, I was hanging around in my bedroom as I was wont to do at about two in the morning playing guitar. And I came up with the idea for listening to music and called him up and played it for him. And I had it all the way through, even had the words, which was unheard of. And um, woke him up at two in the morning and it might have been later. And he wasn't real thrilled with that, but he said, yeah, maybe. And then... Played it for him the next day, and he was much more enthusiastic. That went in the studio along with a whole lot of other tunes. That was our first launch, if you will. second album and that one really took off compared to the first one what was the sea change between the first and second record because you guys had two top 40 hits on the second record on Toulouse Street right the well, first album I have to be honest with you it didn't represent the band accurately I'm not blaming anybody it's just I guess Lenny had this vision of what he wanted to do with the band which was more of an acoustic album yeah so we wrote a lot of songs that fit in that vein one rocker and, and nobody that was it everything else was kind of no, but when we played live, we were playing blues rock and we were jamming and it went you know, on for 20 minutes and, you know, it just wasn't what we were doing live. Right. So when we got to the second album, we opened it up a little more. It still wasn't like Jimi Hendrix Unchained, but it was a little more frisky than the first album. Probably just more representative of what you guys were like live. It was. We were still a little bit harder live than that, but it, but it was. It was much more representative of what yeah. we could do. And that was also the first album for new bassist Tyron Porter. What did he bring to the band that wasn't there before that? A lot. Tyron is a very unique bass player. His style, I don't know anybody that's played quite like Tyron. His bass lines are melodic. They're lyrical. They, they seem to have a life of their own. And I've heard this from so many people who are bass players that they really think Tyron came up with some incredible parts through his entire tenure of time in the Dewey Brothers. Yeah. Amazing movement in his parts. I mean, and the way that he'll transition between progressions, it's very lyrical almost. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Plus, he, he can sing well. Uh, usually he had the bottom, which was perfect, because yeah. I would be in the middle and Pat would be on top. Right. On the harmony stuff, I mean. Sure. And um, the guy we've been using kind of got canned, <laughs> to be honest <laughs> with you. And uh, that was that. And we just kept that way that the... the Biggest addition, and it was on that album, was uh, Mike Cossack on drums. So all of a sudden, we were a two-drummer band. 
hey, yeah. Um, Almond Brothers, and I don't know too many other two Well, I was bands. just going to say, that's one of the questions I've got down here. There really aren't that many double drubber bands out there. You said Almond Brothers, 38 Special, Grateful Dead, obviously. What did you like about the double drummer vibe that made you want to give it a try and then adopt it and have it become part of your sound? Well, I'll be honest, at first I was a little worried that it might not work. But once I heard it, which was up at the Chateau in Santa Cruz Mountains, it was powerful. And it brought a whole new power front to the band that we had never had before. And Mike was a hell of a drummer. He was like a studio quality drummer. And so that added a nice touch to the band, just finesse, uh, pocket, all that kind of thing. Right. So that, that made a big difference. Yeah, but he left not too long after that. I mean, he, uh, Keith Knutson replaced him in 73. Actually, 74. Mike decided, and I never did understand what that was about, because nobody, he didn't tell me. He just, uh, and he, um, he must have told somebody, but I found out. We all found out. Yeah. That he wanted to lead the band. And so what he did is he swapped with Keith Knudsen, who was playing drums for Bonnaroo. And so he went to play drums for Bonnaroo because he, he liked Bobby Winkle and he liked that bunch. How funny is that? I have the personality thing, I can tell you. <laughs> and then Keith came over with us and I loved Keith he was a great guy he was yeah awesome. yeah and you got you got uh, the benefit you got another singer with Keith too didn't you yes absolutely yeah he had a good voice and um so that was not too long before we went and did that big huge extravaganza tour the Warner Brothers music tour in Europe with however many bands eight bands or something like that wow and um uh, so that that was a good introduction for Keith to be around the band and play a lot. I mean, we had done gigs before that, but that kind of cemented his position in the band as far as being part of the overall sound and stuff. And vocally and drums and everything, you know, drums for sure. And, and then vocally and, and harmonies and stuff like that. Also, on Toulouse Street, that was the first time that Little Feet keyboardist Bill Payne recorded with you guys. That's true. And then he went on to be, he's on each of these albums subsequently on the Quadio Box. And he's now part of the touring band, isn't he? It is. Yeah. Yeah. I talked to him almost every other day. Ted brought him in, and that was a godsend. We all loved Little Feet anyway. Sure. Uh, but that whole New Orleans thing, I, for one, was in love with it. And I'm sure several other guys were, too. I know Pat really loves New Orleans. It fit. I mean, it just fit perfectly. It's not like we were Little Feet. We weren't. I've never heard a band like Little Feet before or since. Yeah. Very original sound. Absolutely. Keyboard fit in with this band perfectly. So it be a B3 or piano or whatever he did, it worked, worked great. Second album in the Quadio box, Captain and Me. I love the cover art on this one. There's this great juxtaposition between the stagecoach, the period costumes, and the unfinished freeway overpass. Where was that shot? Silomar. That was Warner's idea, and and they had just had the 71 Silomar earthquake. That's right. For that piece of the highway fell off. So they brought out a carriage, or more like a stagecoach, really, but whatever, with a whole horse team. Yeah. Gave those those outfits to wear. And that table they put up on top of the freeway, which was nuts. And I think they had a couple of coffins like vampires. We were all playing vampires in a car. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and they shot that thing. It was a lot of fun to do. Oh, I bet. Yeah. And the shot that's on the front of the album down below the freeway overpass. Captain and Me, it was your first top 10 album, which uh, had to feel great. And you had two top 20 hits on this, including Long Train Running which reached number eight. It was a top 10 hit. So tell us about that song, because that one was a really big song for you guys. You know, it's interesting. That song, it was a jam, period. I would make up different words to it every night when we play it live. I never knew what they were going to be. Literally, it was just that. And you take a solo, you take a solo, we have a drum solo, blah, 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 blah. And then, I, you know, Ted got wind of it. I think we might have recorded it when we were doing that session in San Mateo. But I don't think it, it definitely wasn't on the, the tape that went to LA. Yeah. Somehow he heard it, anyways. And he said, You know, you ought to do something with that. And I said, It's just a jam, man. I said, It's fun, but it's just a jam. It's, you know, there's no words. And he says, Well, you know, why don't you try, you know, writing lyrics about a train? So we 
formed it more into a song. It's not a complex song by any means, but it's, um, you know, after I, I sat down and wrote the words about Miss Lucy Lou and her family and the train and all that kind of stuff. Then it started to take on a life of its own and became a tune. And then with a harp solo, I was playing a lot of harmonica in those days. I don't play it now. It became a song. I, I didn't see it. I, I was really surprised that it did that well. I didn't dislike it. I just didn't think it was radio stuff. Not that I was... Who am I to say what's going to be radio stuff? No, I saw Miss Lucy down along the tracks. She lost her home and her family and she won't be coming back. With our love, we're put to be right now. With our love. China Grove, another big one off of that. Growing up, all of my friends swore this song was about weed. Maybe because Grove is in there, and you, you know, it's a, I have no idea why. But this one reached number 15, another top 20 hit for you guys. You guys must have really been cooking at this point. I mean, were your audiences starting to really grow exponentially now in concert? Yeah, they started growing after listening to music. It seemed slowly at the front end, but then all of a sudden it just, boom, we went from playing the Chateau and clubs in San Jose and what have you to playing, you know, bigger hall, but they were still halls, you know, and to playing, you know, arenas by 73, we were playing in large places and sometimes even football stadiums. So it's like happened like that. And that's a big jump mentally and every other kind of way. It's, sure. it, and we were on the road all the time. And that's when China, that's where I got the words from China Grove is driving down that highway into San Antonio there's a road sign that says China Grove. Yeah. I didn't know it at the time. I think I was driving that day. I don't remember. I saw it and forgot it. And speaking of that tune, Billy Bean, when he came in to play the keyboards on it, which is kind of like, I won't say Little Richard, but in that genre. Yeah, sure. And that run in the bridge. That da, 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 yeah. That's when I came up with the words. I said, wow, there it is right there. You know, I didn't say that out loud, but I was thinking that. And I sat down and wrote all the words because up to that point, it didn't have words. And uh, they call them lyrics too, but whatever. <laughs> uh, I just For me, that just like tied it all together. The, yeah. the shit from the samurai swords and the, all that stuff. But um, I give Billy the credos for that. How did you have to restructure your show, both in like gear to, you know, accommodate the larger venues? And also when you're playing a bigger place like that, it's, you almost have to be larger than life on stage, don't you? In order to translate to the back of the large venues. Be honest, I never thought about that. Everybody just did what they do. They just, everybody did what comes naturally. As far as the gear, I don't think you have to talk too many budding musicians into buying new gear. <laughs> <laughs> Not a problem. Everybody will always go for that. Oh, yeah. Uh, we did, and uh, we incorporated dry ice smoke and lighting and you know, all this stuff. Yeah. And it, was, it got really crazy there for a while. It must have been a really exciting time. It was. You have to mentally sort of catch up with it because you're so used to this other lifestyle, all of a sudden, it's out the door. And yeah. you didn't see home very often. Uh, yeah, sure. We're always in a hotel. And by 73, the late 73, early 74, we were flying in the Doobie Liner. So that changed everything. That was awesome. Oh, yeah. Well, I was going to say, what once were vices are now habits. There's a cool little mini poster included in this one on the Quadio box. And yeah. it features in the center a picture of the Doobie Liner. And did you guys get this plane right around that time? Was that was about the era when you got it? Up to that point, we'd been doing everything from starting with rented cars, and then we moved up to Winnebago, which was really insane. Some more great songs, of course, on this one. Uh, one that is such a great example of the excellent harmonies you guys create together, Blackwater. It's a classic rock staple still to this day. It gets played all the time. Tell us about that one. It was Pat's. 
I guess he had been playing that lick for a while and Teddy heard it and then literally said, why don't you do something with that? And so Pat did. I didn't even sing on the harmonies in that song. I ended up singing at the end, just doing these scats. The, the, the whole thing I did on that whole tune. And I don't even know exactly why, but that's the way it ended up. 73 was kind of a out there year. Anyhow, but... Um, a blur? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It got blurry from 72 to 75. But anyway, uh, <laughs> he came up with that whole idea. So I, I give him all the credit for that, for everything on that song. And that round they figured out, I think Ted probably had something to do with that. Uh, da, 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 oh, oh, man. I want to hang a hand, take me by the hand, pretty mama, tell him dance with you, baby, you all night long. I'd like to hear some funk at Dixieland, pretty mama, come and take me by the hand. I want to hang a hand, take me by the hand, pretty mama, tell him dance with you, baby, you all night long. I'd like to hear some funk at Dixieland, pretty mama, come and take me by the hand. Come on, baby. It's almost Americana meets Dixieland or something. Absolutely, and, it is. I mean, all I was missing was this like Dixieland with trombone horn section and everything in the background. Yeah. And people loved it. But it was on the flip side of Another Park, Another Sunday, which is the first thing they put out. And for whatever reason, they yanked that off the air after it got to where we got. I'm not sure where it got. Some station in Roanoke, Virginia started playing Blackwater on regular rotation. Just because the guy liked song. Right. And he started playing it a lot. And then somehow somebody in Minneapolis, I don't understand that one. That's a long way. Yeah, that's a long, yeah, it's a jump. <laughs> but they picked it up and did the same thing. And Warner's went, bingo, let's get this. And they did. And they put it up, and it was our first number one record. Blackwater is one of these great live and isolation videos that you guys have just recently released. We did, yeah. How did you guys actually technically get this done when you're all in different locations? Well, we have one guy in the band, John McPhee, who is very adept in the studio. He's really good. So what we did is each of us have software of one type or another. I run Performer, Pat runs Pro Tools. John has everything, Pro Tools, Performer, window logic logic yeah or all that so we would just cut our part to a you know we'd get a track that have a click track on it and you would go through the whole thing and then you would put down your guitar part you could also put down your vocal part at the same time actually send it to john that would send his stuff to john we've got three more done now but they haven't been released yet he put all that together and then we gave them to another gentleman rob arthur to do the video. He got into doing this because he's keyboard player for Peter Frampton and he was videoing all Peter's shows. He got pretty adept at doing videos. And so those maybe were kind of the front end of doing these kind of things, these isolation videos for him. Since we put those first two out, first it was Blackwater and then it was listening to the music. And as I said, we have more in the uh, can, so to speak. Now oh, looking forward to those. They're great. I mean, they look great. They sound fantastic. Really fun to watch. Well, you know, I get kudos for John for the sound on that. He does all the engineering and mixing. Yeah, very cool. Well, the last album in the Quadio box is Stampede. It has Take Me In Your Arms, Rock Me A Little While on that one. Talk about that song, because that's just, that has that vibe that a lot of these, like Eyes of Silver on the previous record has. It's got this Doobie Brothers groove that's just undeniable. I had been loving that song for a long time on Motown. And um, there was a couple of original versions, but we rock and rolled it. It had a great feel to it. I just loved that song. I just loved the chords on that song. The melody she used, Kim Weston. The melody she used, it just it just worked. And I think she had a hit with it. And and so I brought it up to the band and I said, what did you guys think about covering this? And if I remember correctly, and I'm not going to swear I do, it was not a, a big, yes, let's do that. It was like, eh, I don't know, that kind of thing. But Ted liked the idea, and we worked it up in the studio, and we kind of turned it into a rock and roll tune.
I think where we ended up with it was awesome. It just had all the elements that I was dreaming of. And plus it, it really pumped. It yeah. just pumped. Yeah, man. No, it's a driver. Uh, one other track on Stampede, Rainy Day Crossroad Blues features Ry Cooter. It does. Yeah. yeah he uh, was also on Warner Brothers. Was that the connection? Is that how you guys hooked up? I wish I could tell you all the musicians we saw constantly at Amigo Studios. Ry being one of them. Yeah. Uh, Rattel, Mandy Newman. God, I can't remember all the people. Uh, Richie Frey. Yeah. Uh, J.D. Souther. There was just a ton of people there all the time. What a cool it was scene. like music center. Everybody was there. James Taylor, um, Carly Simon a few times. But it was just a great place to be at that time in your life. It was awesome. Uh, you got I can only imagine. Sessions and uh, you meet other musicians that you really like. And uh, it, was, it was a lot of fun. Well, right after Stampede, you started experiencing some health issues that sidelined you. What was going on with you personally at that point? Ulcer. Ulcer. Ooh. Big one. <clears throat> but I'd had it since high school. It wasn't like it was brand new. It's just the lifestyle that you get into on the road is not conducive to taking care of an ulcer. And uh, it got bigger and bigger, I guess. Because I'd had it since I was probably 17. Wow. And, uh, I remember having problems with it in high school. And I just kind of forgot about it. And with a freewheeling lifestyle, being on the road and all that entails, it got worse. And yeah. I had quite a few ulcer attacks in 74, I even had them in 73. Um, but by the time we got to going on the road in 75 to tour behind Stampede, it was just, it blew up for lack of a better way to put it. Right. Uh, I ended up going to a hospital and it took a while to come back from that. It was, it was bad. Wow. That's terrible. Basically you just watch your diet and of course, nowadays everything's changed on how you treat an ulcer. But in those days, oh, you got to drink half and half. You got to do this. You got to do that. You wouldn't do that now. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> talk about raising your cholesterol. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, but you know, once they figured out what was going on, I was in the hospital for a good amount of time, and wow. they were recording at that point. And I felt really bad for having to skip on the band. I was a drag. So they had started. They had gotten Mike McDonald and uh -huh. brought him. In. Initially, at first, just to fill in the holes on the tour, vocally, and have a keyboard. I think that moved on in the studio when Mike brought up a few songs of his. And I don't know how that all came about because it wasn't there. Sure. But uh, songs like Take Into the Streets, and, and it worked. Long story short, it worked. <laughs> Then the band took you know a different direction musically but it was still valid it was still really good stuff and so that was the first album like in that direction and i got out of the hospital i got, you know started playing again and i even had a song on that album but um i went on their spring tour with them to promote that album and then stayed with the band until 77 and I just, you know, was not, I still wasn't feeling great. I just said, I'm going to take a break. And I did. And yeah. they went on and they did Living on the Fault Line after, and they had a hit with Taking to the Streets. Yeah. And went on to Living on the Fault Line. And then they went on to Minute by Minute, which was huge. And they, they toured relentlessly. They were all great records. So even though it was a different style of music, they all, they were all just as qualified as anything we'd done. 50th anniversary of the band. Congratulations. A lot of people can't say that that are out there still active. I mean, if a band lasts five years, it's a miracle these days, you know. <laughs> so Michael McDonald is back in the fold for the 50th anniversary tour, which, of course, has been delayed due to COVID. You guys have pushed to 2021 now. How are you guys working it out with you and Michael and the band? What's the show going to be like? Well, we played with Michael a lot of times over the years. He's come and joined us for corporate gigs or something like that. And, and so we play a lot of the tunes that we'll be playing on that tour. And it's, it just happens naturally. Everybody grabs a part and it works fine. It's great. So everything got interrupted by COVID, as you say. This year, was, we got inducted into the Hall of Fame. So you got that. 
Uh, you've got, we were putting out new music, which we still had yet to release. COVID. Yeah. <laughs> and that just shot everything in the foot. So You mentioned the Rock Hall induction. Congratulations. I mean, that's huge. And on the 50th anniversary, that's kind of fitting. That's going to be November 7th. Due to COVID, how is the show going to work this time around? Uh, it's going to be, well, this, we've already, or they, I should, shouldn't say we, they have already taken a lot of footage from us over the years and, and put it together for this. Nobody's going to be there. It's not going right. to be in the hall with nobody in the, in the seats. It's not even that kind of thing. It's basically, I don't know if you call it virtual. I don't know what you call it, but, um, it's going to be like that. This is the first time they've ever done it. We'll see how it works. I mean, hopefully it'll work well. With us, so it's it's Nine Inch Nails, us and Depeche Mode, who are still around. And I don't know what any of those guys are doing. I, I we haven't been told, and we're kind of. It's like whatever you're doing, you're doing, and you don't need to know the rest, kind of thing. And I don't mean that in a bad way, but that's just how it's been run. Sure. Well, Tom, thank you so much for your time today. Great conversation. Thank you. I enjoyed it. I sit in midnight, lady. I'm much obliged. Sure has saved this man whose soul was in need. I thought there was no reason for all these things I do. But the smile that I said I'd return with you. When I was listening to the Quadio box prior to talking with Tom, I AB'd the high-definition mixes against an original pressing of Toulouse Street on vinyl. And I have to say, I preferred the Quadio mix in high-def stereo. It was so clear and well-defined, you could really hear everything that was going on in the mix. Highly recommend it. If you're a Doobie Brothers fan, you really owe it to yourself to grab this set. And if you want to dive deeper past their radio hits and educate yourself about pre-Michael McDonald era output of the Doobies, I can't think of a better place to dive in than here. And remember to catch the 2020 Rock and Roll Hall of Fame induction special showing on HBO starting November 7th. Cheers, folks. Stay safe out there. Thanks very much for tuning in. Don't forget to listen and subscribe on iTunes so you don't miss the next Rhino podcast. Producer for Rhino Entertainment, John Hughes. Produced for Rhino Entertainment by Rich Mayhem Promotions. All rights reserved.